You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 35. Well, hi there, everyone. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. My apologies for the absence. I've been away for four weeks um, since my last podcast. Sounds a little bit like a confessional, doesn't it? But um, anyway, there's been good reason. I have been developing a store for my wife, a web store. So it is called littlegreenworkshops.com.au. And on that, I have put a swag of cheese making equipment. And that's our first line of, of products. So over there is uh, cheese making kits. I've got seven cheese making kits. I've also got actually seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, yeah, seven. Sorry, I had to count them. Seven cheese making kits. I've also got swags of equipment, including cheese presses, thermometers, um, cheese making boards. Uh, some moulds, just some feta moulds, uh, min- uh, measuring spoons and the likes, so, and a bit of cheese wrap, so there's a bit of that on there as well. And we've also got, on the ingredients page, we've got a whole bunch of cultures and moulds and salt and citric acid and two types of rennet, um, so enough to keep the average curd nerd going for quite a while, so... If you're interested, just pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au and click through to the shop. There's a shop tab there. Um, Unfortunately, we only ship within Australia because all of the uh, ingredients in the kits are perishable. Uh, We only ship within Australia. We can get it to most places within two days because those of you out there who have been making cheese for a while will know that the cultures need to be kept in the freezer to prolong their life. Uh, We're going to have to send everything express post uh, and we're going to have to send it during the week to guarantee that people get their cultures in a condition that is going to be fit for cheese making. So... Yeah, so the postage is a little bit more expensive. It's about the same as the other cheese-making sites that I've seen. They all ship stuff uh, express post. So I'm very excited to be able to have our own little online store selling cheese-making gear. Besides all that cheese-making stuff, uh, we're going to have soap-making equipment and we're going to be having... Uh, soy candle making equipment. I know that's not the topic of Little Green Cheese podcast, but uh, just throw that out there. There's a few other things there. So that's uh, one of the things we've been doing. The other thing um, that has uh, knocked us back for six is that uh, my wife's um, mother, in- my wife's mother, not my mother-in-law, um, passed away. So we've been uh, bereaving. So um, I really haven't um, been podcasting that much um, I've been spending a lot of time in my vegetable patch and uh, and just working through uh, the grief you know you really do have to let the grieving process take its course uh, and that's that's exactly what I did and I just didn't unfortunately feel like producing cheese making podcasts but I'm back in front of the microphone again and we'll be having a fortnightly podcast for cheese making uh, on all sorts of topics. So, um, speaking of topics, uh, one thing I was going to talk about was my cheese fridge and how it's been holding up since I bought it about six months ago. Uh, I did produce a YouTube video, and you can find that on littlegreencheese.com. Uh, and It is simply a a bar fridge. It cost me about, I think it was about $150 Australian, um, I think, which is about $140 US. Uh, And uh, and it fits quite nicely next to uh, my washing machine and the laundry. And I connected an external thermostat to it. And that seems to be working very well. The temperature is set at... Uh, about 12 degrees, but it sits anywhere between 11.5 Celsius 
to 13 Celsius, which works out to be about between 53 and 55 Fahrenheit, uh, for those of you who still use Imperial. The cheese matures very well. Um, Its humidity is at about 60%. Um, I'm not too fussed on the humidity because if I'm going to ripen mould cheeses, I put them in a a ripening box and put a little uh, container of water. I use a a soya soya sauce dish. I found it in an old Chinese um, cooking kit. It's a little ceramic bowl. I just put fill that full full of water and put that at the bottom of my ripening box. And if I'm ripening camembert or stilton, then there's room enough for the cheese in there. And that increases the humidity up to about 95% um, relative humidity, so that's fine. So no real issues with the humidity. Same as if I wax cheeses. Um, the humidity's got to be there. It can't be a dry temperature because the cheese will dry out even if it's waxed especially if the temperature starts to go up a bit. So just make sure the humidity is at least over 60, maybe 70% um, percent relative humidity, even if it's waxed. Also, you really don't have to worry about too much about humidity with um, if you vacuum pack your cheese for, for maturation. So I've had no issues with the humidity. I haven't had to put a humidifier in there or anything else like that. So I've had a few cheeses mature, so I've had... Um, Kefili, uh, obviously one of my favourite cheeses, and uh, that's matured with a natural rind, so I haven't had to, um, I haven't had to wax that or anything. It only takes three weeks to mature, and as long as you keep wiping it with brine, it doesn't uh, crack or, or you don't get any defects, any body defects in it. Uh, I've had a Romano sitting in there for about ten months, and that's been vac packed, and that's nearly ready to pull out now. And I've also had a couple of Parmesans that have been in uh, wax and they're sitting in there nicely uh, and that's all doing well. So I've got to get back into cheese making again. I'm starting, I'm, I seem to have no time on weekends now that we've launched this business, um, which is uh, uh, workshops. We seem to have a workshop every single weekend, and uh, but we're having a Christmas break soon, so from... Um, uh, the first week in December all the way through to the end of March. We, we're not teaching. And hopefully I will get a run of days that are going to be under 30 degrees Celsius, so I'll be able to make some cheese. So I, I had a few issues last year because of the cheese fridge that I had. I had a, an old, a wine fridge and the temperature would not stay down low. Uh, where it needs to be, you know, between um, 11 and and 13 degrees Celsius. It was a Peltier-type refrigerator, so it was a wine fridge, and it didn't have proper refrigeration, so it wouldn't keep it cold. Now, I'm hoping over summer this year uh, I'll be able to make whip, whip out a few cheeses when we have some cooler weekends, and then I'll be able to store them in the cheese fridge. No issues at all. Uh, won't have any trouble uh, aging my cheeses over summer like I did last year. So that's uh, that's the cheese fridge update. Now I've got some news. So this uh, news spot comes from uh, comes from the BBC in England. And it's about a lady called Judy Bell. It looks like she's got an MBE, so she's pretty uh, pretty cool. She is the chairwoman of the Thirsk Cheesemakers. Uh, I think she runs a company called Shepherd's Purse Cheese, and she recently won some awards. But I'll uh, I'll play the clip and uh, we'll see how that goes. I started Shepherd's Purse in 1987, making sheep's milk cheeses. And then we progressed on uh, to expand the business using uh, cow's milk and buffalo milk. And people were a little bit reluctant to try them. They were, they were different. So I've spent my time going out and educating people and persuading people and getting them enthused about the products. And eventually, we really have just developed into a wonderful little family business. How old is this back? Ten days. Ten days? In all businesses, I think you you tend to have your ups and downs, and there are times when you think, 
What else can be thrown at us? Foot and mouth disease has already been confirmed at 13 farms within the government's so-called biosecurity cordon. Thousands and more. in 2001, uh, foot and mouth hit us. Um, it didn't really disrupt the cow's milk very much, but it took out probably 50% of our sheep milk flock. Yeah, that was pretty devastating, and it certainly put a lot of pressure on financially. I'm really proud of the business now. It's great to have the girls in charge. It's taken some pressure off my shoulders. They've got the energy and the vitality that I had when I started the business, so it's great to hand it over and, and take a step back. Not a bad yield either. 1989, we launched the brand at the Great Yorkshire Show. So this year is our 25th anniversary. It's great, absolutely fantastic. So that was Judy Bell. Um, she won an award for her cheese company. I'm not sure what the award, there wasn't an award for the cheese or anything, but uh, hang on, I'll just go and check her company. It's uh, Shepherd's Purse Cheeses and yeah, it's Shepherd's Purse Cheeses. Uh, the address is Shepherd's Purse, so that's S H E P H E R D. S, purse, as in P-U-R-S-E dot co dot UK. Uh, yeah, they are award-winning cheesemakers over in the UK. If any of my English listeners um, have tried some of this cheese, the Shepherd's Purse, looks like the award was won for the the Yorkshire Blue, which looks like a fantastic cheese. looks uh, very much like a Stilton, but... Uh, uh, I dare say it probably tastes a little bit different. There's uh, blue vein cheeses which are really yellow. It looks like they've put a natto in the, into the, the milk, into the curds, um, and the other cheeses, the other blue cheeses look very similar to the ones that I make uh, myself, but they look delicious, so they seem to do a lot of blue vein cheese. Um, so, yeah, check it out. I'll put the link in the show notes um, so you can all have a look at that. Uh, and if you're in the UK and you can buy this stuff, then, uh, yeah, try it out and see if it tastes okay. It looks all right, that's for sure. So I've got a few listener questions this week. Um, the first one is from, I hope I don't get the name wrong, Meetar, spelled M-E-I-T-A-R, Meetar. Um, and he says, or she says, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, hey, Gavin, my name is Mita, and I am a fresh home cheese maker from Israel. I just got the bug a few months ago, but I'm loving it so far. I love your podcast and blog and wish to send you my respects for all the effort you made and make. My question is about storing mould cheeses, uh, Camembert, Roque 40 and such, with hard cheeses in the same homemade uh, cheese cave. Uh, my cheese cave, uh, it's got a photo attached and I've had a look at it, uh, is an old fridge which I changed its thermostat level so it gives you between 10 to 13 Celsius and inside I have a humidifier which raises the humidity to about 90% relative humidity. So my conditions seem great for cheese, just that I want to make separate mould cheeses and put them in closed boxes. The humidity in the boxes will be too high. And if I leave them open with the other cheeses, which make an excellent camembert, may cause infections to the other cheeses. Do you have any thoughts on the subject? Thanks and keep on inspiring other people as you do. Well, thanks very much for your question, Mita. Um, yeah, look, I use ripening boxes, no problems at all. They're just plastic boxes, and what they've got in the lid, there's a little um, a button you can press, and you can let some of the uh, some of the moisture out. So the relative humidity, and I've had a uh, hygrometer in in my um, one of my cheese making boxes, or, or sorry, ripening boxes, and the humidity does get to ninety. Um, percent, and that that's what you want for a, a camembert or a blue or a brie. Um, so I don't have too many troubles. It's because I can release some of that moisture into the fridge. So check out, see if you can get some plastic tubs that are the right size, and they've got a raised bottom, uh, and it's got a, uh, a, 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 a it's on the ones I've got. It's a red dot, and you click it, 
and uh, and it pops open. So I think Decor is the plastic company that makes it. I don't know if it's specific to Australia, but uh, yeah, certainly that's where we get it from. I think that you you should be able to source it in Israel. I couldn't see why you wouldn't be able to. But they're perfect ripening boxes because you can release some of the moisture. And you don't get cross-contamination with the other cheeses. The The moulds don't seem to escape the ripening box if uh, because the, the plastic's the boundary, right? Um, even though you're letting a bit of the moisture out. I haven't had cross-contamination. I've had camemberts in the cheese fridge in a ripening box at the same time as I've had kefillis ripening naturally um, with no uh, with no wax or or uh, or vac packed. So um, and they haven't got uh, contaminated with um, penicillium candidum. So I've had no issues there. I've also had blue cheeses in ripening boxes. And I've had um, parmesans uh, aging for the first couple of weeks to to get a rind, and they they haven't been infected as well. So try that out. See if you can find a ripening box. You can let a bit of moisture out, um, so the humidity is not too high. Hope that answers your question, and I hope you got I got your name right. I'm, I apologise if I haven't. Okay, the next question's from Jeff and. Jeff doesn't say where he's from. Says, hi, Gavin. Um, I have a question regarding Parmesan cheeses. I've noticed some, yours included, require lipase, whereas others, several others I've looked at do not. Is there any reason why? Any thoughts? Thanks, Jeff. Well, I'm pretty sure that the traditional recipe for um, Parmigiano-Reggiano uses raw milk. So within raw milk, and they, they use skimmed raw milk, I think, uh, the lipase has not been hasn't been killed by pasteurization and uh, homogenization so the reason that i add lipase back into uh, cheeses like parmesan and romano uh, and mozzarella um, when i make that as well is because i need to add that lipase back in i need to add that flavor uh, that you get traditionally with long-aged Italian cheeses and um, traditional mozzarella, which is made with raw buffalo's milk. So that's the reason I add the lipase back in um, and uh, to get the tradi- traditional flavour because I think one of the very first Parmesans I ever made, I didn't put lipase or didn't put very much in uh, and I found that although the cheese had a nice parmesani sort of flavour, it wasn't very strong. And subsequently, since I've made um, that style of cheese since, and I've put the right amount of lipase in that I have in my recipe now in the Keep Calm and, and Make Cheese ebook, I find that the flavour is a lot stronger, especially after the 12 months maturation. And uh, it's a really robust and full flavoured cheese. Fantastic for grating, fantastic for shaving, yeah. And, and you really got to have if you're going to use store bought milk um, that's been pasteurised and homogenised, add the lipase back in. So that's the main reason, Jeff. And I hope I've answered your question. Uh, next question's from uh, Deb, and Deb is from Victoria, in uh, in Australia. Uh, Deb says, hi, Gavin, quick question about kefili. I've just made my first batch and find that after a week of ageing in the cheese fridge, it has some brown spots on the rind. I've wiped off a few small white mould with brine, but these spots cannot be wiped off. Do you think the cheese has been contaminated and should be thrown away or should I keep going with the ageing? Thanks, Deb. Well, I reply back to Deb's email because she sounded a bit desperate and uh, and and needed some advice. Uh, those brown spots are typically uh, bacteria called um, Brevi liens uh, or B liens, and I think I pronounced that correctly. And uh, it's the 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 bacteria that grows on uh, cheeses like uh, Limburger and Stinky Munster. Um, and a few other of those. Stinking Bishop is another one that I've heard of. And it's fine. It, it, it doesn't contaminate the cheese. Brown mould, as long as it hasn't got black whiskers, uh, then it's it's fine. As long as you keep wiping your cheese with a brine solution, 
uh, daily, especially with Kefili, um, and turning it daily for the for the three weeks, then it's going to be fine. So since that time, and thanks for your question, Deb. Um, since that time, Deb has she has sent me back an email. And uh, and she sent me a photo originally, so I saw what the spots were, and like I said, I, I figured out that they were Belian, so it was no big deal. She sent me a, a, a another email uh, yesterday uh, with a picture, and she said, uh, "Hi Gavin, thanks for your encouragement and help with the kafili. We tried some today, and it was delicious. Really, the best I have tasted. Thanks again, Deb." And she's got a lovely picture. So what I'll do, I'm going to include the picture in the show notes and everybody can check out uh, Kefili. Uh, it looks absolutely delicious. Well, thanks, Deb, for your emails and for the photos and um, allowing me to help you diagnose what was wrong with your Kefili. And there was nothing wrong. It was fantastic. Beautiful Kefili. Like I said, about a thousand times. One of my favourite cheeses. I better get into the kitchen and start making some, so... Anyway, well, that's all the questions that I've got this week. There's been a gamut of um, of YouTube questions, but they're really one-line answers, so I don't think they're much value. Um, you can check out my YouTube video cheese to tutorials, and I think one of the last ones I made was Colby. It's been a while since I have made a, a tutorial, but that's because um, I haven't made uh, cheese in the last ooh, few months because um, I've been teaching how to make cheese instead. Uh, so I really do have to pull my finger out and make a few more. There are a few cheeses that I want to make. I want to make a Red Leicester and I want to make a, I think there's a Gloucester style cheese. I want to try one of those. So some of the more of the, the traditional old English cheeses, I want to try a few of those. There's a few mould ripened cheeses that I want to try and make. There's a recipe that my friend um, Ian Trower or Truer uh, from Canada uh, sent to me. And uh, it's called Little Squirrel. It's a mould ripened cheese. Uh, doesn't ripen very much. It's not like a camembert or anything like that, uh, but it has wrinkly skin uh, and it is a uh, mould ripened. I think it's got geotrichum um, as the, the mould. So I want to give that a go as well. So I'm going to be busy um, over the next few weeks until, like I said, the end of December. Uh, sorry, the start of December with workshops. So um, I won't be able to start making cheese and until such time. So over the uh, Christmas break, uh, when I have a bit of time, I'll uh, get in the kitchen if it's not too hot and make another couple of a cheese making video tutorial. That'll be lovely. Anyway, that's all I've got time for, folks. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. For upcoming workshop dates uh, and all my recipes, you can find those over on littlegreencheese.com. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, you can find all my cheese making kits, equipment and ingredients over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Unfortunately, we only ship to Australia, so uh, international listeners, uh, I apologise in advance. If you want to check out my cheese making ebook, you can do so over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find a hard copy now, which I ship to Australia over at uh, littlegreenworkshops.com and uh, you can check that out there. I've printed and bound it and uh, it's available for everybody. You can also find my video tutorials over on my uh, YouTube channel or within the ebook. Um, they're available to play. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows.